Hello and welcome. I am so delighted to have Cheryl Llewellyn joining us today. I'm just going to read a little bit, Cheryl, about you so that everyone is inspired to keep listening. So Cheryl is a licensed therapist and Reiki master. She helps clients release traumatic events that have been stored in their system. And I've just called her Cheryl, but she goes by her author's name of CJ, which I really like. So CJ utilizes the knowledge of the vagus nerve. I am so curious about this and the etheric energies and such as the chakras to help people overcome traumatic reactions so that they can connect more easily to their inner light. I love that. And the vagus nerve has been referred to as the soul nerve. And through this nerve, you register safety with others. It's the so-called wiring that helps you negotiate your world. And this nerve transmits information between most of the organs in your body, including your heart, lungs, digestive system and brain. And with the assistance of your seven main chakras, the vagus nerve can be a psychological and spiritual powerhouse for deepening the relationship with your soul. And I just happen to have the book here. Oh. Chakras and the vagus nerve discusses the importance of healing your trauma and reconnecting with your body as a means to your spiritual evolution. CJ will discuss how she has seen the vagus nerve align with the seven chakras in her work with clients. And she'll talk about the three main branches of the vagus, share techniques to engage the safety branch of your vagus, and I should have said your vagus nerve, and helps you listen more carefully to the messages your chakras and vagus nerve have for you. Wow, that's such a lot. And I it have is. been skimming through your book and I'm going, oh, my goodness, I want to talk to you about this so much because I resonate with it. I resonate with many of the chapters that you have because it aligns with the work that I have been doing as well. But we, have, we, we only met like late last year in 2023 but so much of the work that you've been doing over the decades resonates with what I've been doing, but we've not known about each other. And I love how that happens. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started on your journey and why the vagus nerve? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you know, so I, I, I walked two worlds um, I'm a trauma therapist and I have that clinical training. Um, and I'm also a Reiki master. So I have that, that connection to the etheric energies. I just sort of generally call it the etheric energies in this, with these conversations. So when I'm doing trauma work, I'm hearing and listening with that knowledge in the, in the back of my head, but I'm not, you generally using it like when you're you know when you're doing energy work this is full on what you are doing and your clients are aware of it I'm just listening like an energy worker as well but I have a background in a lot of body mind modalities that and EMDR in particular is where I started to really see this which is using your eye movement back and mm -hmm. forth there's a whole protocol that goes with tra the trauma processing part of this and EMDR has been around for almost probably 40 years at this point. Mm -hmm. So what I would see as we would be working through a trauma. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're recording. I never said a word. Oops. We'll keep it's going. Funny. Hey, you know, um, <laughs> I lock the door so my animals don't get in when I'm talking like this. Um, hello. <laughs> Um, so when I would be working through a trauma, I would, uh, you know, and we're kind of working back and forth, 
and clients are sharing what is happening within them. Yeah. Um, psychologically, memory wise, I could see again through also I have this this knowledge of polyvagal theory and I'll, I'll break that down in a minute. So I'm listening for their ner- nervous system. I'm listening how they're processing. We're, we've got this whole just um, what do I want to say like unit going together. And I'm thinking, wow, as they're talking about their early childhood experiences and sometimes memories that they had before they actually could remember them in their brain, that's going through the root chakra or connection with others. Oh, no, 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 no. I want to know, how did you know that that's going through the root chakra? Well, because they would be reporting it. So they would say, well, this is you know, I'm having, where are you feeling it? Well, I'm feeling it down here, but I don't have this memory, but it feels like that time, like I'm needing my mother kind of, you know, something along those lines or the connection up, you know, in the sacral chakra, which is connection. That's early childhood. That's how I was seeing that, that pattern going. This is early childhood Mm -hmm. connection. Um, and they would be feeling, you know, if they were having, if there was a trauma that was childhood related with maybe a parent or someone they love, um, and, and upward. So, you know, I was starting to see identity, right. When they get older and they start seeing themselves with the solar plexus, right. Out there in the world, forming who they are in their mind and identity burning through the solar plexus. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes heartbreak, right. When we would, uh, yeah. be processing through things that were really hard because these were people that they loved that hurt them they would feel the heartbreak in here but they could also repair in this way too so I, I, I started to watch sometimes we have situations where clients have been told all their lives their voices don't matter right oh but this shuts down and I'm sure you see that too as yeah. an energy worker and so backing up a little bit also as part of my training as a client as a client as a as a clinician is this understanding of polyvagal theory which came on board about 30 years ago as well Mm -hmm. and the whole concept with polyvagal theory is this vagus nerve which is the largest of the autonomic nerves in our system it's the largest autonomic right autonomic in this case just think of automatic right it's the largest nerve it's the one that keeps our heart beating our breath going it helps our digestion so i had been studying that because i as a trauma therapist working through um just trauma in our bodies that locks us down had an awareness of how this is all affecting our body in that way too Right. And I'll break down. Now you keep touching up here. So, oh, I do. <laughs> uh, maybe that's me. <laughs> but is the is that related to lo, the vagus it nerve? It is. Yeah. So I'll break down a little. I'll I'll break down a little of the vagus nerve based on polyvagal theory. These this okay. is not my research. Uh, this is this is Stephen Porges's research that he's been doing since the seventies on the vagus nerve. Um, and as he was doing this research, by the way, a lot of trauma therapists were saying, hey, we see this happening in our clients. Right. So what the gist of what we were seeing with his research is what looks like an emotional reaction is really a neurobiological. It's a, it's a physical reaction based on how our nervous system is reacting to certain situations based on interpretation of past events. Do you know right. what? As you're saying that, all the nerves have just opened on the crown of my head like flowers. Love it. Yeah. Yes. Wow. So hang on, hang on. What I just thought then is that that's an autonomic response. Mm-hmm. So there's there's no mind control over that autonomic response. Right. Wow. So we this is the so-called problem when I'm working with clients who feel such shame, mm-hmm. right? I can't help. Every time I see this, I want to do this or that, or I run or I freeze. Those are autonomic responses based on how events have been interpreted and stored 
yeah. in our nervous system, in this case, our vagus nerve, right? So we know, you know, those times we know better, but something happens, we woo, we woo, you know, yeah. but our brain's going, why are you doing that? Yeah, yeah. There's two separate processes, processes oh. going on. The brain, obviously, and the nervous system work in conjunction with each other. Yeah. But there are moments when our nervous system is ahead of the brain. Let's right. put it that way. Yeah. Right. Our nervous system is going, I know that noise. I know that noise. And our brain hasn't even interpreted what we just did. Right. And so what happens in with trauma work is people come to you and they, they've got all these these responses and these shutdowns and they interpret them as emotion. And this is one of my pet peeves is people say, Oh, negative emotions. No, you're having a neurobiological response That's based on things that were unpleasant. Right. Yes. So, you know, after I do um, some, some processes with a, a tra after I process a tra traumatic event with a client, let's put it that way. Yeah. They'll say, but I'm still feeling sad. I'm really feeling sad. I thought this would go away. And what we have to do is like I, t I say, it's like we're peeling the two layers of the paper. Sadness is the emotional response. Yeah. That's the emotion. Sadness, even in that intense, intense feeling has softness around it. That's from the soul. You know, this, this bad thing happened. You mm. are entitled to feel sad about it. What you no longer have is, the, the, I call that the charge. So it's it, the, the charge. charge. Yes. It's actually like an electrical charge that. And it's going through your vagus nerve. Yeah, right. See, I didn't know that that's what was happening. I just knew that yep. when I work with people and remove the charge, they still can feel sad or afraid, but the charge isn't there and you can see their body can stay relaxed when they think about it. Right. And they can, they can access what they can do is actually access emotion. Yeah. Right. And what they don't have is the charge. I call yeah. the punch. You know, sometimes you yeah. just get the woof or you shut down. So I'll go back just a second when I was talking about the branches and this is based again on polyvagal theory. Think of it as the only thing you have to think about in regards to if the concept of thinking about your nervous system is too much, it sounds too much like biology class. There's three branches and these three branches help manage us in the world. And they are all in, in service of safety to us. Yeah. Okay. The, the oldest branch, I, I do this yeah. because it's, it's called dorsal vagal. Right? right. It's a dorsal vagal. It's think of it as the dorsal fin. It's not technically the one it's way in the back, but, but it has a lot of components that yeah. shut you down. What it does is it helps conserve energy. So it's about immobility. And there are times when someone has had, you know, if I'm working with some complex trauma, they have a tendency to shut down, dissociate. So it's inconvenient to them at times. Mm -hmm. Or they're not in the room, even though they're in the room, they're not in yeah. the room. Um, their body has learned as it's gauging and sometimes uh, not gauging properly, right? Mm -hmm. They might be in the room thinking they are unsafe when they are safe, right? Because it's all how we've interpreted things through the years and they might shut down. But the immobility is, is there in service of of, of holding energy for us could you just explain a little bit more about the immobility is that that they literally can't move sometimes sometimes they they dissociate sometimes they can't move um you know plain possum right just think of a possum yeah all Plus mammals still. have yeah. dorsal vagal dorsal vagal goes throughout most sentient beings so Think of when a possum gets scared, what does a possum do? The possum doesn't say, you know, I don't like this dog. I'm going to do this thing. Yeah. The possum goes, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that dorsal vagal branch. That's right. shutting them down because that in the possum is, is how it survives. Mm -hmm. It collapses. Right. And then, and then later the dog, the dog goes on and later the possum wakes up and just keeps going. 
Yeah. So that that's a real primitive example of what mm -hmm. the dorsal vagal branch does. So it's immobility. Then we have mobility. Mm -hmm. That is the sympathetic branch. That's that what people I hear people say a lot, that's the fight or flight branch. Yeah, it is. When we are in perceived danger, mm -hmm. we're going to fight or we're going to run, mm -hmm. right? Or we're going to freeze based on the dorsal vagal response, right? So, so some of these are just so neuro, they're just so intuitive to our body. Our brain isn't even correct just in at that point, yes. right? So it's so intuitive to our body um, when we're in danger. But mobility, again, like immobility, is kind of a neutral place because we mm. need mobility. Mm. Sometimes children, children, it's a great example of children. Children connect through play. Children connect through being mobile and, and running around and jumping around. So um, mobility is just as important. So you have immobility, mobility, and then you have, this is where I was touching my face. Yeah. Yeah. And my heart and this whole area. Yeah. This is safety. Right. So this is ventral vagal. So, but but I always say just think of safety, mobility, and immobility. Right. And then with that knowledge, just notice sometimes when you have maybe it's a charge, because the charge sometimes comes from that sympathetic. When you are relaxed or when you're kind of mm -hmm. and just notice because we have a tendency then to put all sorts of meaning to some of this stuff and oh gosh what's wrong with me mm -hmm. you know? um and oh that emotion is coming up again it's not emotion but it takes a while to discern the difference between a deep emotion especially when it's a one that we don't necessarily want to claim like anger mm -hmm. right? or deep sadness but that's the soul that's what I see at the end of a processing session. I see clients accessing soul energy because right. they're going, oh, right? Yeah. And it's a whole new experience for them, especially if they have had a lot of trauma growing up throughout their lives. They're used to kind of being on. They're used to engaging differently. Mm -hmm. Once we start clearing that out, I'll just see them sitting in my office going, oh, because it's clear they can access themselves. They can access their energy. Mm. And then, it, you know, over time, especially if we've got multiple traumas that we want to process over time, they're different. Mm. They're not reacting the same. They're not having those neurobiological responses of those charges. Like you said, yeah, they're, they're, they're aware of what's happening in their body and they can access their emotions. They're not afraid of their emotions. I say it like that because right. it's not, right? they're not emotions. Yeah. And that's why, and of course I don't use what I jokingly refer to as the S word all the time. I live in a very conservative part of the world. So I'm very, but much about meeting someone where they're at mm -hmm. in their whole, their whole world. So I'm not coming to them and using the soul word yeah you know but i see it. oh is that and the I'm s like, word energy the s word i was always joking the s word you know because oh. sometimes, sometimes i have people who um are very um atheists so i'm not going to say that well that's your soul so i'm just allowing them to have the experience yeah In my mind what's their soul i know it's their energy yeah. it's a higher wiser energy that's sitting there yeah also. right and now I can have a calm conversation with my wife about that thing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what, and so it, it um, I, I think in, I, I think in systems, I always see the connections. I like to see, I just naturally sort of see connections between things. Yeah. So that's where the trauma processing, backing up just a, a little too, I was starting to see the nerves are aligning with where we're seeing the set, what we call the seven main chakras, right? Mm. And so then I take it, as you see in the book, I break that down into, I, d I don't do Sanskrit interpretations in the book because I'm kind of giving you a lot anyway. <laughs> yeah. Giving you ball, bagel, theory, yeah, yeah. chakra, yeah. you know, all that. 
So um, there's other places for that. There's other places for that, right. But but I'm seeing these in regards to the dimensions of who we are as humans. Yeah. The body has that root chakra. That's survival, still survival. And that I can see that processing. My clients will process through that. And that also has to do with a lot of the, the sympathetic and the dorsal you know, the, those mobility and mobility, a lot of digestive, you can't see my, I'm talking, I'm touching my stomach right now. A lot of digestive uh, energy going on here Yeah, because the, the, the vagus nerve is the main nerve. It is the nerve that helps with all the digestive processes we have. Yeah. And there's it's two so interesting. I just want to interrupt here because it's dropped in like several times when you were talking before about the um, the soul and that there's that like almost like the fatigue, I didn't know what you're talking about. This is new for me, which is really awesome. But I was shown maybe 30 years ago I had chronic fatigue 30 years ago. I was quite unwell and I was tired a lot. So we didn't have the internet back then. So I couldn't just Google it. And so I used to just lie in bed and say, God, you've got to help me. What do I need to do? And I got shown a process for balancing the chakras. And it, it it's, it's, I've recorded it. It's um, on Insight Timer. But some days I just want to curl up and go back to bed. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with me? Like, that's my first question. What is wrong with me? And then when I see myself curl in the fetal position on the bed, I go, oh, I'm a wise up to you. I know what's going on. So I do my chakra balance. No word of a lie. I can't keep my eyes open. In three minutes, I'm like my all my energy's there and I'm back and I'm like, right, let's get into it. What what can we do? And what you just explained about accessing the soul energy and realigning all the energy, that's what I have been doing. I don't know if other people have that same experience, but it is so important to work with your energy centers when you feel drained or exhausted. And that's my number one thing. I will do that first. If that doesn't work, then I'll go and look for something else to help. But that's my number one. And let me kind of add to that layer, right? Because yeah. when you start working, of course, you're starting to calm your body. Right. right? We're working our our chakra centers you're calming your body mm. then you're getting up into safety and i'll show you more about some of the exercises and why yeah but there's like two sections like i know i just said three branches but there's also supra over diaphragm sections this is this is ventral right this is a right. safety right right and from the diaphragm up from the heart chakra up right, is when we're getting into the, they're, they're rapid and they calm quickly branch of our nervous system. Everything down, it's not coded, so it's, it, it communicates a little slower, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is if we're stressed, we're out of balance, right? Our central nervous system sending all these energies. Oh my gosh, we've got to go. We've got to do this. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different ways that that, you know, you get into fatigue because we're constantly reading a lack of safety. Or we're going, 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 we're blowing up our cortisol levels, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's shutting our bodies down, our body down because we just can't keep going any further. Yeah. Um, when you are working those energies, you're calming your system. Right. Then when you get into this shock, this chakra, you're getting into ventral vagal safety right. portions of, of the vagus nerve. When we do this, I bet you you were doing some breath work. You know? Do you know what? I've not learned any breath work. 
but there is a type of breath work that I stumbled upon that I don't normally do, but it's one of the things that I teach people to do. Yeah. And here's the thing. It doesn't even have to be fancy Mm. because when we pull a breath in, we automatically are calming this nerve, right? This is the nerve in here. I, I should have put my, I have a little, little descriptor up here that I have my book cover up here, but I should put the map up here of the vagus nerve. It, this is a nerve that is attaching to your lungs. This is the real autonomic part, right? It's attaching to your heart. It's attaching up here to your throat and your middle ear. When you pull a breath in, anybody does it because it's how we're built. Yeah. We automatically calm down. Wow. You know, everybody says, take a deep breath. Yeah. 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 And yeah. they say, um, count to 10 before you speak. But what I say to people is take 10 breaths. Well, which is so much more effective, right? Because yeah. count to 10 before you speak, you could still be good. I know. I know. And your brain so would go, okay, I'm breath. done with 10. Now let me tell you what I want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like a whole different process. Take the breaths. <laughs> and because what happens is it does calm down. Right. And so here's a real, real cool thing. If you take a down, you know, not even, like I said, a fancy breath, people sometimes get, they think they have to go doing the more pranayama or something, you know, yeah. we don't have to do anything fancy. Um, best thing, do a breath through your, through your nose. Cause it filters through your, you know, filters anything out, pull it down as, you know, as far as you can into the lungs, just because we always tend to breathe at the top of our lungs. Right. Yeah. And then just slowly. I call it flute breathing. Just slowly breathe like you're blowing into a penny whistle or a flute. Right. As slow as you can go. Nothing, again, nothing too intimidating. That slows your heart rate down. It's like slowing that. your lungs down. Yeah. And what it does is it increases not just the slow heartbeat, but the beat between the beats. Right. So... That's when we can start really getting into, we don't think of it this way. Think of heart health. We think of lung health. That's when we start getting into nervous system health. Right. Now, I have a question here. Some of our community experience POTS, which is postural something, something, where they, they stand up, they feel lightheaded, and their heart goes like really fast. And it's quite distressing for people to have that really fast heartbeat. If they do that breathing that you just explained, will that help their heart slow back down and reset yes, itself? Yes, it's helping to reset the nervous system, that, wow. that safety portion yeah. of the nervous system. Yeah. And over time, I mean, I don't, obviously I'm not a doctor. No. Um, and over time, what that does is it starts developing. Um, it's like, you know, when we work a muscle, muscle yeah. gets stronger. When we can think about the health of our nervous system and get ourselves back into safety quicker, mm. we are more adaptable in that nervous system. Right. Which affects everything else. It affects everything else. Yeah. And I always say, this is why I see the chakras and the soul is the same. And uh, you probably do too. Because when we die, we don't have any more etheric energy in us. That's gone. Yeah. <laughs> Back to where it's supposed to go, right? It's a soul. It's the, to me, the way I was seeing it with clients is that it is the soul energy working through the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Almost like, I like to sort of, I mean, what kind of metaphor do you use except maybe the driver of the car, mm -hmm. right? It's using, I think, it seems to use like the central nervous system, the brain, it's trying to drive the car. Yeah. Okay, we want to go here now. We want to go on this adventure. Can you take us here? Because we are, right, spiritual beings having human experience. But when we get trauma and it stores in our system, which, by the way, it's supposed to store when we're safe and not safe, because that's our body. That's the, that's the tension. Our yeah. body's saying... No, no, no. The last time we did that, we almost died. We're not going there again. 
Yep. Um, and so our body is trying to keep us safe. And then it can misread cues, right? It can get a little hypervigilant about something. Or sometimes people who are used to a lot of drama and, and, and trauma uh, growing up misread lack of safety and think, oh, this is okay. So our central nervous system, that's why to me trauma, well, trauma uh, where resets the central nervous system, then we can accurately gauge. Right. So really people then need to learn a new response language. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And it has to come from a place of mindfulness and non-judgment. Mm. Right? Yeah. Oh, I'm noticing. You, you know, you were saying the same thing where we all do it. Oh, I, even us healers do it. Oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? Yeah. I need to push through this. Why yeah. am I just did all the things? Why am I still tired? You know, yeah. we still those that brain, those parts of us just want to just yeah tell us what we think they think we need to know but if we can just say huh oh i'm noticing that when this mm-hmm. person walked in the room my heart rate went up and not in a good way mm-hmm. <laughs> first let me breathe and just notice be curious yeah, yeah yeah curiosity i think is the absolute key to personal growth and uh self-understanding absolutely because it takes a judgment out of it yeah judgment blocks everything doesn't mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. it just puts the wall up yeah and it's kind of like polarizing and what i have been saying for many years is that if you can step out of polarity then the nervous system actually settles Mm -hmm. because it gets back into safety. Yeah. Yep. That's why I keep doing this. It keeps like touching here. It's really cool too. Um, So when I see the throat chakra and that's the, you know, I, I use a lot of when I'm utilizing and connecting to energy, I I utilize a lot of my third eye uh, more sight. Yep. One one of the few times I actually just sat there and saw somebody's chakra physically. I, I mentioned that in the book. I don't know if you've read that. Um, I never told this person this. So I'm using very general terms. I saw this person speaking and I saw that blue that we talk about, you know, that sort of yeah beautiful indigo blue. And I saw this energy in her throat, but it didn't make sense to me at the time because it was coming up and going back into her mouth and kind of engulfing this whole, right. this was years ago. This is before I actually this, I had, hadn't even graduated from grad school, mm. hadn't really honed and developed and gotten all sorts of training and trauma work. I'm like, what the heck was, is that? This mm. That's what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to be this circle, right? Mm-hmm. That's what we're talking and I sat there forever trying not to blink because I, I didn't want that to go away. Eventually, you know, I blinked and it did. Yeah. But it stuck in my head because it didn't make sense. But then when I started studying polyvagal theory to apply it to the trauma work, it's like, oh my gosh, it makes total sense. Here's why. And I explained this. Yeah. So these nerves, the ventral vagal fibers, the safety branch, right? They not only connecting to the heart and the lungs, they come up in into the the, the throat. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the branches are connected to various functions in the throat, and they go up into the middle ear. Right. So when we are listening, because again, this goes to in service of safety. When we are listening, like you and I are listening right now, differently than if suddenly sirens went off in our rooms. Correct. So our ears, our middle ears. They're like apertures of a, of a camera. They're smaller right now because it's just you and I, we're, we're just talking. Mm. But if, you know, our plate started to break or something, those apertures open up because suddenly we have to listen to their surroundings. Yeah. And, but the voice also goes to safety. Like right now you and I are just having a, you know, great conversation, right? Yeah. So 
we're not raised up in in a high pitch of lack of safety or down here in a lack of anger we're in a nice range yeah so that's part of the safety how we hear a voice is part of how we register safety not to mention how our eyes are gauging but but specifically this one was like oh my gosh this is like an extension of the throat chakra because the middle ears all connect all this safety in here Mm -hmm. how a voice is how if a dog is growling we know we gotta get out of there right it's low correct yeah dangerous right but if the dog is kind of cutely whimpering we're we're good we're safe yeah yeah so how the range of voice and how it affects our listening and how our listening how our middle ear shifts and changes because of these fibers has so much to do with all of this Mm. so you know you know who am i I, you know sort of maintain this is all part of the chakra yeah i mean we know that you know there's different um uh practices Mm. that talk about various chakras throughout the body. I mean, that's, we know that. I mean, that's yeah. when you're talking about these seven main, main yep. branches that are connecting, this one goes, I've, I've seen it. And now I know, wow, that yeah. information was given to me 20 years ago. Wow. I just figured out. And so, you know, I'm really glad that it was. And it's, it's <laughs> interesting because I had five diseases here. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And one 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 of them was cancer. And it was the the surgeon had to touch my my vocal cord nerve to remove the cancer. And then I lost my voice for a year. Yeah. And so part of that ventral vagal. Yeah. Yeah. And um how I got my voice back was I just said to God, if you want me to share what I've learned, you, I want my voice back and I promise to share. And seriously, within within three, three to four months of making that commitment and doing the work, like I went to a speech pathologist and I did the work, but I got my voice back and what I do is I use the air in my lungs to make my left vocal cord work. Mm-hmm. It's all part of that branch. Yeah, I didn't know any of that. And so people say to me, how did you learn to speak again? And I said, because I use the air in my lungs like a didgeridoo player. And when I run out of air, I have to take another breath because otherwise my vocals don't work. Yep. And, and that's so, all part of that, that nerve. It's it's so interesting, I mean, isn't it? It and is. I'm looking for the the I yeah, have it yeah. page where that 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 schema is in here. So right. And um maybe six months ago, I don't this this is a stupid thing to do. I decided that I wanted to see if I could put my hands flat on the floor, standing up, (laughs) like bend forward, put my hands flat on the, and I was in the shower. So the hot water made me more flexible. (laughs) And so I put my hands on the floor and I just went down a little bit further each time. Oh my goodness. The pain in my left, like I felt like I had a pickaxe in my left lung Ooh. And it was like something was trapped, but I couldn't release it. And I was thinking, what have I done? What have I done? And I tried all of my techniques. I tried everything that I could do. In the end, I went, okay, I'll have to go to the osteopath. And that's a two-hour drive for me to get to the osteopath. And then when I woke up in the morning, it was fixed. I don't know how it fixed. But I have a friend who's a physiotherapist and I was explaining all of these symptoms to her. She said, oh, Julie, I think you trapped your vagus nerve. And I went, oh, that's good to know. Well, you know what? I did it the other day. I I thought, damn, I 
recognize that feeling, but what did I do to do that? And because it didn't, oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah I have this. I have this. Yeah. I don't want to get up in the middle of this, but so it's like, as if I, you were facing, this is like the two sides as you're facing, but then the, tr the head's turned. You could see yes. all the nerves here. Yes. And these are, you have two sides doing two different things, but they're doing, you know, they're all, they're all in service of the same job. Some yep. of them are connected to the liver on one side, and, but yes. Yeah. So this is, well, is what you're talking about. I, I have fixed it. it this time. And I think it was because I didn't worry about it. I knew what it was and I just let my body relax and it un, untrapped itself. When you're talking, one of the things that, and you know, seriously, I think the Buddhist monks, of course, they've you know been doing this for thousands of years. They maybe didn't have access to some of the medical things that we do that we can measure and see now, but they yeah. knew, they knew there was something in the, the sense of calm that had to do with the nervous system. When you hum, you know, when you're, mm -hmm. or even the, oh, mm, yeah, I'm still not brave enough to do it in front of people when I do podcasts right now, yeah. but the, oh, gives you that nice mid range. Yeah. Right? And it's calming. It's calming all of this, you yeah. know. Oh, and so humming, even in the shower, especially that's where I like to sing. <laughs> that's it'll so calm this. That's so interesting. You say that CJ, because that's how I got my voice back. I was so embarrassed. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was so embarrassed by what was coming out of my mouth that I would only do it in the car because it was, um, so the speech therapist got me to start doing e, but it was all patchy because I couldn't control it. And so I chanted in the car for an hour every day. Yeah. And, and I didn't care like, what I sounded like because it was it, it was a resonance that really happened in here. And within four months I could speak mm -hmm. yeah and it's mid-range right it's, so mm -hmm. it's 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 not too high it's not yeah. oh my god it's not ooh, it's oh yeah so yeah I, I you know I always I mean the Buddhists got this right <laughs> the yeah. monks no they intuitively you know practice through thousands of years yep and you just yeah. knew that's, I think, one of the cool things is I talk to people who have uh, different trainings. You know, I've been talking to a lot of spiritual healers, mm. uh, just had a, a great conversation with a medium. Um, it's all utilizing the vagus nerve because we have to calm down enough to tune into spirit. Yeah. That's the soul. Yeah. If we can get ourselves down to where our bodies are feeling safe enough, then we can access spirituality. Yeah. And, asking. you know, in that, in calming the body, I'm, I don't know what even made me start doing this, but I started taking photos with my cam my phone of small flowers. And so I would get really like super close to the flower to get a macro shot without a macro lens. And so what I noticed when I got close to a flower, even if there was no breeze, the flower would start moving. And so I used to have to really consciously calm my nervous system. I would hold my breath and I would center myself. The flower would stop moving and I would get the perfect, clear, crisp shot. So I've been doing that for about seven years now. And what I noticed was if I'm feeling jagged in my energy or something's not flowing or I can't get this thing to, I can't find the answer, the solution, I'll get up, I'll go outside and I'll take photos of flowers and the flowers would tell me when I had reached that 
harmony inside because they stopped moving when I approached them. Mm -hmm. And it took 20 minutes. That's it. I resented myself with taking the flower photos in 20 minutes and then it got shorter and shorter until I could just go and be still and nature wouldn't uh, feel the ripple of my jagged energy. Absolutely. Yeah, you calmed it. And, you know, gosh, there's so many things I want to share with you right now. There's a lot of studies going on. I talked to the um, director of HeartMath. I don't know if you're oh, familiar with that. I've heard of them. They, yeah. the, oh my gosh, the work they're doing is incredible. They are starting to measure electromagnetic fields throughout the earth. Right. They're, they're, the gist of what they're doing is so simple. And it's yeah. just, it's, it's what you do, it's what I do. It's all, you know, it, it all comes together as if we could simply find our calm right breathe yeah and you know my i in my world like oh yeah get into ventral vagal activity right get it get i mean engagement right get into that calming heart rate slows yeah then we have a peaceful world that's <laughs> i mean that, that's heart math is you know worldwide i mean they're doing yeah. incredible uh worldwide stuff i'm but but it's exactly what you're saying and so you're also a tuning when we go into nature it calms us down it does there's there we are connected to that field that electromagnetic field we have it within us and we are yep. connected and that's why the japanese call it forest bathing because mm -hmm. they're connecting to the fields of the trees and it's calming their nervous systems and they notice the impact of their day-to-day -day life when they go into nature and it's nature is healing. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And so there's another thing I want to share with you. Yeah. And there's a, this is, um, it's sort of a psychology, it's like a neuropsychology term, but it's called, you said, we're talking about what we are talking about now is regulating our system. Yes. Right? Getting ourselves calm and you're utilizing nature to do that. And you're also utilizing nature to indicate, okay, my calm, mm -hmm. that, right? There's, and so this is regulation, but there's something called co-regulation and it is the concept. It's, it's, it's not just, it's not just a theory. It, it actually happens that one nervous system can regulate another mm -hmm. or can disrupt. Yeah. Right? Do you ever, someone came in the room and you all of a sudden you're like, man, I was calm until that person walked in. Um, yeah. and, and the best example of this would be holding our babies mm. when we were little, right? I mean, you're a mom, I'm a mom. We would calm them. We were intuitively doing it, right? We would calm them and yeah. rock them yeah. when they were upset. What we are showing them intuitively is that this is how you calm your nervous system. And my nervous system is gonna, I, for some reason, I was, I was this way. Some people do it this way. <laughs> But, you know, this is how you calm your nervous system. And I'm going to help so you, you do that. You just Fine. hold yourself like this. Right. Yeah. I'll show you something else. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to get all that stuff to talk about this. Just what you just did now. So you saw that there are two sides. There's two there's two sides to the nervous system. I'm talking branches earlier about safety branches, but there's also two sides, right? It's bilateral. Same way we have two sides of our brain. We have yep. lots of other aspects of the brain, but we, when you look at it straight on, it's got, yep. we got two sides. Yeah. So it's bilateral, right? We're doing this and just do one of these. Oh, try that right now. Yeah. See how you, just a slow one. This is so interesting because I have um, a blood pressure program that I bought from Christian Goodman. And part of what he does there is this. And he said to walk, but I didn't want to go outside and walk around. So what I did was I would get into bed and I would just tap 
with my finger mm -hmm. on my leg, one leg, and I just go left, right with one leg and one finger. But what would happen is my finger would get slower and lighter until I was just kind of going like that. And I could feel as I did that, my whole nervous system relaxing. And that's what you're talking about. And I had totally forgotten that I would do that. And, and it doesn't really take much. And I always say, no. because when we get in a trauma process and we're doing it more rapidly, and I always say, do not do that because then you're going to start stirring things up. Yeah. Um, but just this, this, if you feel comfortable, some of my clients do exactly what you were just saying. This, the legs, just that one, two, four yeah. fingers. It, yeah. Everybody's a little different. Yeah. What we're doing is we're rocking ourselves. Yes. And we're engaging the safety portions of our that's are so cool therapists. right isn't it yeah. it's just amazing and plus if you really take it down our etheric energy starts opening up right you can start really feeling in this case you can really feel the heart chakra and then yeah. what happens is everything else calms down yeah so i call these like the essentials you know the the ones that, because these are the ones we ground with these are the ones yeah. that reveal a lot of old history old in our, in our, yeah you know, about uh, around safety in our system. Comes. And this is just a bilateral tap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the reason why, I, I feel like sometimes I repeat this too much, but I can't say it enough. Yeah. The walking is a built-in bilateral stimulation. Wow. One foot in front of the other. It yeah. doesn't have to be fast. One, then one. But we, we make it, the we take the mindful process out of it right yeah we make it oh we we got to put how many steps in today and i do the same thing i there's a big hill in front of my house i'm like okay good morning we're going up the hill first <laughs> you yeah know? but it's just a one two one two it is built in and think about when you are nervous and you want to pace mm. you're really calm so people are doing that to actually like there's a there's a physiological reason why people pace. Yep. yep. And because I've, I've seen people say, stop doing that. Stop. No. I You're know, not right? Walk. Because the person who's the observer watching someone pace, it makes them nervous. And they should get up and walk too. Correct. Yep. yep. Oh, my gosh. CJ, we could talk all day. I know. And I'm yeah. like, I so I get so excited about this. I don't, I hope I'm not throwing too much at you, but this is the thing. And you, you know, you showed you were just sharing so much about how you intuitively started to hum. Yeah. Right. And if we can take the judgment out and be curious. Yeah. And not go to, well, this sounds stupid. Why would I want to hum while I'm, you know, in the car kind of thing or whatever we do, you know, however yeah. we talk to ourselves. Yeah. And just listen. It's already built in. If we just listen when we're nervous, get up and walk. That is the mobility branch. Right. And they, and um, there, there's a, a Peter Levine, who's, who's a, who brought a lot of conversation over the last several decades about um, movement mm. in regards to trauma and he, he brought a lot of that in by observing animals mm. an animal just think of a bird when it hits the window yeah I, i'm in my spring up here um you know there's a lot of birds hitting my windows <laughs> but they may hit it and they may fall for a minute mm. and they may stay still for a minute because they probably went they shut down a little bit right yeah but if you take that bird and put it in a cage it's gonna end up with just sort of weird anxiety. If you let the bird just do what it needs to do, you can watch it and eventually it'll get up, start shaking itself off, right? Yeah. Why? Yeah. So when we are in situations where stop, stop pacing. Yeah. And sitting when we're maybe not feeling safe, right? We are taking this ner this nervous energy, we're taking this fear, whatever's happening, and we're letting it sit in our system. And we're locking it in. Yes. 
and anchoring it in. And that's why for my students, I say to them, if somebody is upset or angry, don't touch them. Because don't even have a conversation with them because that's, that's anchoring it thing. in. Wait. They can connect yeah. safely with you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And that's what that's when we and I used to do this years ago too. That's when we want to have the biggest conversation. Well, you're upset. Let's talk about it. Yeah. And then we get upset that the other person can't talk because that's that goes in all brain science too, right? They're just like, hmm. Yeah. You can just let them go. Yeah. Let them just do whatever they need to do, like the bird shaking it out. Correct. They can come back when they're calmer. We can come back when we're calmer. Yeah. We're not in that, that's a fight or flight kind of response, right? We're not engaging in that sympathetic. That's yeah. one of those ways that we kind of abuse that mobility branch. Right. right? We need to talk about this now. So we can just go off, work it out, just, just attention we have this stuff built in yeah yeah we, so modern- basically it's um remembering that we have all the tools within us to reset ourselves and to self-regulate and to live more harmoniously like our our autonomic nervous system and our physical system living in harmony really isn't it it is it is and there are times when people experience outside of that range right of oh yeah. i'm just a little nervous cuz i have to pay my taxes kind of thing and and even being able to say oh, I'm noticing this thing is happening and I can't seem to manage. Then we can seek the right guidance and help, help yeah. right? And and even that doesn't have shame to it yeah. because it's, it's again, it's your system has been on overload, especially if there's been a lot yeah. of childhood trauma. Yeah. You've been registering, I'm not safe for a long time and these people are supposed to be my safe people. Yeah. Right. And so the central nervous system, your your autonomic nervous system is is on overload. It's, it, it's yeah. Like, yeah. That's why I and, say the data sets are on overload. And that happened to me a few weeks ago, but it wasn't because of challenging things or bad things. It was when I got excited about doing a lot of things. Right. So it was all exciting. And it was a final thing that I said, oh, I want to come to Sedona and I want to run a retreat in Sedona and and I want to go to this conference and I want to do this and I want to do that. And then my whole nervous system did did what you just did. And the <laughs> Wait a was minute. Rushing through me and I was sitting like this. And I, I, I knew I was wild eyed and I knew that I, I didn't have the capacity to get it all calm again. So I rang my daughter, who's like the best person to ring. And she goes, okay, mom. Okay. So have you done? And I kind of remember what she said. And she said, oh, that's right. She said, have you checked the chi in your body? What's the chi doing? What's the chi in your nervous system? Is it excessive? And I said, yes, it is. She said, well, just just make it balanced and in harmony. So I did that. Like she just talked me through the things that I know to do. And then she said, you know what, mum, we don't have to do that this year. We can do that next year. We don't have to do a retreat. So she took it all off the table. And my nervous system just went like that. And I went, okay, I'm good again. You co-regulated with her. You talked to somebody. I did. I did. And was safe. And you went, oh, my gosh, what am I doing? And she went, (laughs) She did. She did. And you felt safe. Yes. You felt like, oh, we can co-regulate over the phone. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's exactly what happened. And, you know, she said, do you need to clear your energy? Do you need to... You know, so she had a whole list of things to get me to check that 
in the state that I was in, I didn't have capacity to check. Mm -hmm. And so she just like one, one tick at a time, we worked our way through and then, then I was fine. Like it all happened. I, I called it my perfect storm and mm -hmm. everything came together. And I guess we should probably wrap up. We've been talking for like 70 minutes. Oh, oh um, my goodness. I think what I, I want to wrap up with is that A, we can get help. Like there's help available. B, we can co-regulate with somebody else. We can self-regulate. We can do the little things that's going to help us on a day-to-day -day basis and build that muscle that you were talking about. And if just breathing, if we do that breathing that you suggested early on, in through the nose and out through the, the pinhole oh, in our lips. Yep. Like, and that slows that right down. Mm -hmm. That is going to be helpful, right? And, of course, there's your amazing book. It's full of exercises. It's full of easy explanation of how we can be self-empowered on our journey on the planet. And, and I'm so glad that you feel it accessible because that's my absolutely. biggest thing. Sure Absolutely. And the exciting news is next week, Cheryl has to get, is the, am I correct? You have to get the final draft to the publishers for your next book. I, I did. Oh, gosh. I have so much going on. Talk about ah, <laughs> expansion can be stressful, too. Yes, I, I got this draft and I'm waiting to hear back. Okay. From my so so book two is in process wow. um and it's it's really getting into the soul which yeah love it you know just that um yeah and i'm um, doing some a seven week course on the shift network coming up yeah, here tell us tell us about that what's that all so about this is, um the shift network mm -hmm. uh dot com you can just you can look on there my class starts on the 28th and I think registration is, um, oh my goodness, I don't have it in front of me, but it's a couple of weeks before that. You can register up until, and we're doing a seven week course on this. So we're That's taking fantastic. this in great detail yeah. over seven weeks and I'll have all sorts of exercises. That's what I'm really excited about because I can really help break it down. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's a platform for it. And, and they're just fantastic. Shift Network is, is fantastic for all sorts of classes anyway. Yeah. And um, I got a couple of things going on, but those are so really I'm going to put the, guys, I'm going to put the details for the classes and where they can get your book and uh, connect with you. I'll put that in the description in anywhere where we post this. But, yeah, I'm so excited that you're bringing this work to the world and, that we met yeah I am too I am yeah. too I feel like yeah. I've, I've met a real soulmate here wonderful energy that you have and and all the healing that you've been bringing to the world too is just amazing thank you now one last thing what would be the the message that you want to let end up end today with I, I think it's really simple just be kind to yourself mm. You know, and and really where you can, like you said, apply curiosity. Yeah. When we're curious about what's going on, we can take the judgment out of it. We're not separating ourselves from ourselves. What did you say? The wall. We're not putting a wall up. Yeah. We're just being curious and kind. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. When it's hard. Right? Thank you so much. And um, I think Thank we'll you. have to do a, a a second episode because I think we have so much more to chat about. And, um, yeah, I can't wait to see what next for you. So everyone listening, I hope you've enjoyed our chat today and support Cheryl in her course if this speaks to you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. See ya. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for having me.